Good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanisha Shields and I am a Senior Land Services Officer with Western Local Land Services. Today we will be hearing from Graham Reese of KLA Marketing about profit and cash flow in livestock. I will start today's webinar with some housekeeping. You should see the following screen, following control panel on your screen. If you don't, you need to click on the orange arrow to display the control panel. Here you can choose your audio option as well as ask some questions. You are in listen only mode, which means that you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. Today's presentation will be recorded and you will be sent a link to the recording within 24 hours. We will be answering the questions you have sent through already in your registration form. Throughout the webinar, if you have more questions, you can ask these questions by typing them into the question box. Graham will then answer your questions at the end of the webinar. I will start today's webinar with a quick poll. This helps us to gauge who is joining us today and check that the program is working correctly. So just launching that poll now. So we have 67% of people have voted. So I'll give, give the poll a few more seconds and then I will close that poll. All right, I'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. So from today's webinar, we have 37% of people joining us are sheep producers, 11% are goat producers, 42% are cattle producers, we have 11% mixed species producers and 26% are advisors. I will hide that poll now and I'll just do one more quick poll. So I'll launch this one to you guys. This poll's just asking you whether you trade livestock and how routinely you're trading livestock. Okay, we've got 74% of votes, so I will begin to close the poll down in five, four, three, two, one. So as a result of that poll, we see 33% trade routinely as part of your business model, 38% are trading opportunistically, 14% have a self-replacing breeding operation and 19% are advisors. I will now hand over to Graham. So Graham is a fourth generation sheep and wool producer who grew up on the family property at Ivanhoe in Western New South Wales. In 1999, Graham was able to spend some time with Bud Williams on his visit to Australia, which ignited an interest in low stress stock handling. 2002, Graham joined with Jim Lindsay to deliver these low stress stock handling schools right across Australia, now assisting thousands of livestock handlers to improve their livestock handling. After spending three weeks with Rod visiting Bud in Texas, Graham, along with his partners, spent the next 12 months developing KLR Marketing School. He is passionate about sharing both low stress stock handling and KLR marketing because they both open up the opportunity to everyone involved in the livestock industry. I will now make you the presenter, Graham. Okay. 
Okay, here we go. Share my screen. Okay, can you see the screen okay? Yep, that looks good to go. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, evening, everybody. It's great to be here with you all in probably uh, the best part of the world, Western New South Wales. I mean, I, I grew up and spent most of my life out there and uh, and certainly uh, I probably know some of you and if not, I, I, I know some of your families, but I certainly know that country really well. And, uh, you know, I guess I've been lucky enough to travel in most areas of Australia and I still uh, still think that Western New South Wales is actually a golden place to be, especially if you're a livestock producer. Uh, and as we've just shared, you know, my story is I did uh, grow up and spend most of my life at Ivanhoe. Our family, uh, uh, my great grandfather started out there and, and then my grandfather, my dad, and then my two brothers are still out there and my sister is still out there as well. So, um, you know, I guess I still, um, still call that uh, spiritually home anyway, if nothing else. Uh, but in 2003, two, we left to um, educate our kids and, and it was just at a time when uh, I, I'd, I'd not long met Bud Williams. And Bud Williams is, uh, he was somebody pretty special. He came out here to Australia to teach stockmanship schools. And I think, you know, just like a lot of people, um, I went along to that school thinking, oh, well, I trust the people who brought him out here and maybe I'll learn something. And and I walked out of those two days realising I didn't know much about stockmanship. I was lucky enough to take Bud and his wife Eunice home for four days and, and we became good good lifelong friends. And uh, today Bud's passed away. However, um, his legacy still lives on. Uh, and I get, after that, I, I, I wanted to share that information. And so I teamed up with Jim Lindsay and some other, other guys and we started teaching low stress stock handling schools across Australia to sheep and cattle producers. And uh, it was when Bud was out here in 2002, he suggested that he had some marketing information that would really help producers in Australia. So we actually went over to the US uh, and spent time with Bud really to get it for ourselves. But while we were there, he, he said, look, I'm not coming back. You guys need to learn how to teach this stuff. So, so we did and since that time, um, you know, we've taught the KLR school in most areas of Australia and and uh, got a, a lot of producers, both sheep and cattle breeders and traders using uh, these methods. Um, and the other thing is, is, is also I've, I've led uh, a couple of graziers tours to the US in the last couple of years. And I think, uh, you know, certainly learned a lot teaming up with people over there that are, that are using a lot of this information. Now, Bud Williams said, the number one unfair advantage in grazing is knowing how to market your animals. And I think that's a really important statement because we can do a really good job of production as producers. And we can take, you know, sometimes it's, it, with, with, with sheep, it's quite a bit quicker, but with, with cattle, you know, it can be one and two years before we're actually selling that animal. And how we sell that animal is gonna determine the profit that we actually get. You know, a lot of what we do is with production, but we can win or lose uh, at the, on that day of sale if, if we don't um, get things right. At KLR, we talk about five principles. And uh, the first one is balance the inventories of grass, money, and livestock. And that's the one I'll talk a little bit more about today. The second principle is every day we sell or buy. And that doesn't mean you're going to the market every day, but, but fundamentally every day we, uh, we don't sell an animal, we just bought grass uh, for that animal for that day. We need to know the price relationship between what we're buying and selling. And, and uh, KLR really helps with, with knowing that because when we know the price relationship, we can understand what's overpriced and underpriced in the market. And then uh, the fourth principle, sell the overpriced by the underpriced. And sometimes you know, again, it, it, the analogy is relating to grass, money, and livestock. It's not just the animals. Um, you know, when we're when grass is overpriced, then we're going to buy underpriced animals, and when when we're lacking grass, then animals can become overpriced. 
And then the fifth principle, know and understand yourself. And and uh, it's it's quite often graduates come back to us and say, actually, uh, after a couple of years, we realise that principle is is the key principle because if we don't understand ourselves and how we make decisions, then it's going to be a, a challenge for us. Now, let's just talk about that first principle, balancing the inventories of grass, money and livestock. And if we look at a, you know, a teeter-totter or like a seesaw there, uh, we can have grass on one end. And when we talk about grass, take a look at this photo here. You know, it, this, this shows management and no management. So we really uh, need to focus on that. We've got to understand we are grass producers. We're not livestock producers. We're grass producers first and then how we sell that grass can be sold in many different ways. We could sell that grass to animals we own, which could be breeding stock, they could be uh, they could be trading stock or a bit of both. We could sell that grass as a gistment. And or we could sell that grass, you know, not out there, but in a lot of areas we could sell that grass as hay. So there's many ways to sell grass and I think one of the things that we need to do is focus back on uh, back on that. Now we must uh, we must have more grass than we have animals for. That's one of the things that I often talk about. You know, um, one of the um, a lot of people uh, just bear with me for a sec. Sorry about that. Um, so we must have more uh, grass than we have animals for. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, I guess I get to travel around a lot of Australia and I see uh, I, I see paddocks that have got no grass in them and they've got animals. And, uh, you know, we, we really uh, need to start there, but then there's some more advanced grass management courses we can go and do. There's lots of great programs. Um, so as I said, you know, we can sell grass to the animals we own, we can sell it to sheep, cattle, um, but how we sell our grass is going to be our profit. Now also on that end of the, of the teeter-totter or the seesaw, if you like, is, is money. So we have grass and money in one end and then we add livestock. And as long as we can keep that in balance or even have a little bit more grass and a little bit more money than we have livestock, we'll be fine. However, you know, as it, as it gets dry or a bushfire comes along or something happens, then that often can get out of tilter. And if that gets out of, out of kilter, then what's going to happen is we have to make some choices. Now, some of those choices are really around, um, you know, do we sell some livestock? Do we feed the livestock? Do we uh, adjust the livestock? But we must do something because if we, if and if we decide to feed, then we're going to use some of our money to buy grass, which is hay, and and we'll be able to do that. The um, and we've got to keep it in balance, and so that's the fundamental thing that we need to focus on is is that. And if we can do that, actually, it removes a whole lot of emotion around managing our way through situations. And I guess you know if we look at across, um, you know, one of the things we offer to graduates is a mastermind, and if you look across uh, the the spectrum of people, we've got people still in drought from 2013, been totally de since that time, but they're still in good shape because they they did follow those those things. Why do we get out of balance? Well, because we get so focused on the price. You know, three dollars on the way down is never as good as three dollars on the way up. So, you know, we we really um, we may have paid too much for animals, or we get focused on price, and we go. I'll sell them when I get to this price. I've got to hang on to them to get out of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's all perspective though. $3 on the way down is never as good as $3 on the way up. So, um, the, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we get caught focusing on price. And as I've touched, you know, getting out of balance really makes us struggle on our grass inventory and our, re and our land resource. It makes us struggle at our money resource and and uh, and then obviously the livestock struggle as well. So we don't want to be in that position. Just want to talk a little bit about where we 
get ourselves caught up in this industry. And I think uh, there's so much noise out there in the industry. We're always, you know, what's the most common thing we want to talk about? We want to talk about the weather. When will it rain? When's the drought going to break? When's it? When, when? You know, when? When's the bushfire going to go away? When's COVID-19 going away? There's so many things. We talk about market prices. We listen to the news, news, uh, country hour. We read the newspapers. And we can get caught up focusing on things like those bigger, broader things. You know, right now at this time in May 2020, what are we talking about? We're talking about China's actually um, uh, not taking beef from four abattoirs. We're talking about how much COVID-19 is affecting uh, the livestock industry. Uh, the live export industry has has things affecting it. And we get caught up in that. However, we can't do anything about it. See, the area where we can do something about it is inside the circle of influence. When we understand that when we work inside the circle of influence, and often I call that working inside our boundary fence, then we can get, take control of our, of our livestock business. You know, we can control what we sell. We can control what we buy. We can work out what our cost of production is. And we can match our carrying capacity to our stocking rate and, and we can also manage our cash flow. And so if we can manage those things, then we, we're not going to be worrying too much about some of those other things. And then we, you know, that's how we balance our inventory. We don't worry about what's coming or what's going to happen. What is happening right here today? And I think we talk about that a lot at KLR is we talk a lot about just managing for today. Let's not worry about what's going to happen in five, six months' time. Now, I just want to touch on what I call the three arenas of marketing. This was shared with me by Jeff Watson, who was a former senior lecturer at marketing of marketing at CSU in Orange. And this three arenas of marketing made huge sense to me at the time, but it wasn't until I met Bud Williams that I really, uh, it really reinforced which arena I was working in. And uh, the first arena Jeff talked about was the product arena. The product arena is where we might be actually selling our saltbush lamb as a product on the shelf in Woolies or at a farmer's market or somewhere. We'll have our own branded products. And, you know, some people are doing very well in that space. And one of the things when you get in that space is you can actually receive a higher price. And so it makes sense to talk about, uh, you know, getting a higher price for it. The second arena is the alliance arena. In the alliance arena, that's where we might all get together and have the have a co-op and uh, and sell. You know, we might be selling uh, a brand of, of of lamb or beef from from an area. Uh, and again, those cooperatives can can work uh, very well, but they also and they can increase the price for for the group. However. There's also uh, a downfall, and that is people in fact, both the product and the alliance arena, uh, they're actually people businesses rather than what I talk about uh, here is the commodity arena. The commodity arena is where 99.9% .9 of us work. And when you understand the rules around the commodity arena, you then know how to manage it. You see, here's the thing, we're price takers. Yet what do we do? When we meet, get together and if ever the pub's ever open again, we get to the pub and what we're talking about the market, what do we talk about? You know, how much, how much did you get for that set of cattle? How much did you make for those sheep? We are price takers. We actually have zero control over the price. You know, the market fell because, because uh, there was no grass and then it's rained and so the market rises. The biggest influences of the market are livestock producers. It's not the feedlots, it's not the, the, the processors, it is us. And so if we take into account that we're price takers, then that's not inside our circle of influence. That's, that's in our circle of concern. What is in our circle of influence is we have control over our costs. And, and when we can know what our costs are, then we can start to control them. So at KLR, we've, we've uh, developed our own terminology. We call that the cost of carry. And the cost of carry is really um, moving an animal from one grade to the next. So, um, you know, in a breeding enterprise, 
when we sell animals, we create cash flow. And, and you know, so say we say we're running a, a, a cattle operation and we're selling all our steers after they've grown out, or we're running a sheep operation, we're selling our weather lambs, that's going to create cash flow. And that cash has to be allocated to two things. It's got to be allocated to the cost of carry for running for the next year, all our sales, plus there's an element of profit in there. And when I talk cost of carry, cost of carry includes all our direct costs and also our overheads. And we take uh, we, we take our overheads and use a unique tool called the business analyzer, which turns the overheads into an adjustment rate. So then every animal is paying rent uh, on a on a weekly basis. If we were in a breeding enterprise or a trading enterprise, oh, sorry, if we're in a trading enterprise or a backgrounding enterprise, when we liquidate, that cash flow has to be used for three things. It needs to be used to replace with the new animals or if we're not replacing, put that money aside so we can replace new animals later on, we need to allocate some money to the cost of carry and allocate some to the profit. So in, a, in effect, we're always putting our cost of carry aside at the front of the trade, not at the back of the trade. And that includes the cash flow to pay our overheads. When we know our cost of carry, that allows us to know what and when to sell, what and when to keep, and what and when to buy and and you know bear in mind even if you're not a trader you don't klr still can work we spend half a day on the second day of the school just talking about breeding because fundamentally you can never buy an animal and have this work for you because understanding what it costs me to take a wiener steer through to the feedlot weight is going to determine whether it's profitable or not using our cost of carry so you know, it's easy to say all that pretty quickly, but basically, uh, fundamentally, in a, if we look at this from a simple trade point of view, now the way most people uh, in the industry trade is they're trading on what I call a buy-sell paradigm. And in a buy-sell paradigm, we're buying an animal uh, today at say $1,000 in the hope that we're gonna make some capital gain in the spring. and we're trying to anticipate what the market's going to do. What KLR is talking about, what we're talking about here is a sell-buy paradigm, totally different. It's a different way of thinking about it. And, and when we can get that uh, clearly in our head, and I, I'm not saying it's easy to understand, um, but when we sell an animal and we buy an animal, we're, we're, we're taking away the buy, we're taking away the cost to carry, and then whatever's left over is a profit or loss. So if we, I should have put some figures there, but say we sold for um, $1,500 and we buy back for $1,000 and we had a cost of carry of $400, there's $100 profit. Now as a breeder, we can use it the other way. We can say, okay, the buy is my wiener. What's, it got, what's my cost of carry to move that up to the sell? And we can determine whether I should keep that animal or sell that animal. Um, we've got some more advanced tools that really help people. This is an app that we we developed to help people. And so it's not as uh, it's not very difficult to work these things out. Once you work out your cost of carry, you can then take a look at what's your most profitable options to take. And remember, it's not just the math, so it's not just the market. It goes back to what I originally talked about. It goes back to our grass inventory and how much grass we've got. Um, you know, our margin is relative to our, our cost of carry. So the margin is, as I explained, it's, it's, it's the difference between the sell and the buy and the cost of carry. And, you know, that varies at times. It's going to vary between producers. Every one of you on here will have a dis different cost of carry. And so what's profitable for one business may not be profitable for another business. Uh, at times, the, 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 you know, the, this, in both sheep and cattle right now, it has been, uh, when you put the cost of carry in there for most people, it hasn't been profitable to buy some of those young cattle. However, that changes, it doesn't stay that way too long and it, it's starting to open up again. And that also includes time, time's important. Just gonna take a quick look at breeding. So it cost of running a breeder from weaning to weaning. So that's gonna be a whole 12 months. 
and we're going to breed it. Well, I'm just going to use cattle here, but the sheep producers can see the same. We're going to breed a steer and a heifer wiener, and then we've got to take into account all our costs. So our cost of carrying a breeding operation is we've got our bull costs, we've got our drench and vaccine, we've got our mustering, we've got our calf branding, interest costs, replacements, all of those go to make up our total direct costs. Now, when I say interest there, just so that no one tweaks a question, that interest is any money we might have used to borrow the livestock. It's not our interest on our land or, or our general interest. These are direct costs related to that livestock, plus our adjustment rate. And as I said earlier, that's uh, we use the business analyzer tool to put our overheads in and, and break it down into an adjustment rate per week. And so then, we multiply that by the weeks held and now we've got a cost of carry to run that cattle breeding enterprise. And so in every step of the way, there's a cost of carry. To take that steer wiener to sale is a cost of carry. To take that heifer wiener to a first pregnancy, we have a cost of carry and we're moving our way all the way through the cycle and back into the breeding herd. Now it's important to know this. You know, here's an example. So. Uh, in Northern Australia, they did a phone survey of what uh, first calf pregnancies were and what second calf pregnancies were. And the example I'm thinking of, uh, the phone survey came back with 65% pregnancy rate for second calf heifers. Now the people running that survey, the department said, we don't believe that. And so they went out and physically preg tested tens of thousands of heifers across Northern Australia and it was less than 20%. Now in a breeding enterprise, the figures we do, you, in, a she, in a cattle breeding enterprise, you need better than 83% just to maintain your herd. So it's, um, it is uh, very, very important if you wanna run a profitable breeding enterprise to understand that stuff. Now knowing, knowing your cost of carry uh, helps us make decisions and I think that's fundamentally what KLR is about. It's really about making decisions on a on a day-to-day -day basis, understanding what our grass inventory is, understanding what animals we have in our livestock inventory, understanding the value of those animals and are they overpriced or underpriced to take forward and um, I think that's something that um, you know, we take something that can be pretty difficult, but turn it into something pretty simple. And um, and and then the profit comes out the other end. Now, I, I've just put a couple of slides here to show you some figures. And um, I might do this now rather than do it. I was going to do it after we do some questions, but I think I'll just quickly run through this now so that you can see a couple of different options. So these options, I just quickly put these into the calculator to today. And I often people, uh, this shows you why price is not the important thing. So on the left here, uh, I've put, it's dry, we have no feed and the growth rate, virtually no growth rate. I've used steers because it was just simple, but you could equate this to anything. I've used virtually no growth rate on those steers and um, uh, we're, we're actually looking at taking those 250 kilo steers to 450. Uh, that price is 320, which is about what it was when it was dry, and the buy was 290. Um, as a and you whoop, and you can see there up here in the uh, weeks held, we're going to hold. You just got to hold them forever, but you're going to lose money. On the right, we actually uh, are selling them for four dollars, but we're buying them for five dollars. But see, we've got a 0.8 a kilo day weight gain, and uh, and we're going to hold them for 35 weeks, so it's $255 profit. Um, just quickly there, down you can see there on the trade uh, annualised, there's there's a 7% loss as against 26% gain. Have a look at another one here. What if we bought them and fed them? And I've used pretty conservative figures in my feeding costs, but uh, this was put to me by some rural councillors and they said, you know, what if we can get them get them cheap and, and feed them? And so I put in 0.6, uh, but we had to feed, I, I conservative rate, I fed them $25 a week. And um, you can see there, we're still going to lose uh, a significant amount of money. We have a look at another scenario here. 
buy them cheap. So they said, well, what if we could buy them for $1.50 a kilo? This was back two years ago. I had So they put these scenarios, but I put these in today. And uh, assuming I'm feeding them $25 a week, I'm still going to lose money. So you can see why it's not about the price. You can see there in the summary pages the difference between the different different options. And so, you know, we're tying all that money up, but we're making no money. And whereas here, we're actually uh, got a profitable trade. So just to finish up, you know, KLR Marketing is a we run a two and a half day school, and um, we we're coming out to Broken Hill. Um, reasonably soon, working with Western uh, Lands, local land services to, to put that school on. We would have been coming, we would have been actually there, what, next week. However, um, because of this COVID situation, we're just waiting until things open up and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be coming out there. If you want to find more information now, you can go to klrmarketing.com.au, but um, but also, if you're interested in coming to that school, you don't have to register. You can't register at the moment, but there's a there's a place on that on the home page klrmarketing.com.au where you can actually um, reg register your interest, and you'll get first offer for the school. But um, I'm going to I'm not sure how to stop my screen share. I think you'll have to do that, and uh, I'm going to come back to you. What is it? Stop screen showing. There we go. There we go. We're back. How's that, 30 minutes? Perfect, thank you, Graham. Um, everyone should be able to see my screen now, so we'll commence the, the question and answer session and just start going through some of those questions that you all sent in when you registered. Uh, so, Graham, the first question we have is, in what ways are people using KLR? Oh, look, that's a good question, and, and, and I think um, we, our smallest producer started with four head and now runs quite a few. Um, another one started with 10 head and, and um, has, has built that up. So that's a small producer. And then we, we have other other producers that are running about 30,000. So, <clears throat> um, and they're running a breeding enterprise. We've got quite a lot of big and big cattle enterprises in the north using uh, using what we, we teach. Um, and then we also got a lot of sheep enterprises across, right across Australia, really. But I think, um, you know, Jim, Jim, Rod, Jim and Rod are still full-time producers. And, um, you know, I'm a part-time, I, I manage a place here at Bathurst, but um, work with a lot, of, a lot of producers as well. And what we see is, um, how people make decisions. I think that's the most important thing. Doesn't matter on the enterprise. It can be a sheep, cattle, bre uh, cattle, goats. Was actually, um, Jim runs a lot of goats. And where we've seen it really help is in the drought in the, in the north. And actually, there's quite a few uh, producers in Western New South Wales. They've used this to make really good decisions to protect themselves through the drought. Uh, more recently, we had the bushfires and we had some producers affected in those bushfires and it's really helped them to make quick, calm decisions to destock. And now they've had rain and they're making restocking decisions. So um, it really is about the thinking. I mean, the tools and the calculators and those things in and around it, you know, support that. But it's the ability to make a decision. It's never always the perfect decision, but making no decision is is a poor poor way to think about it. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. So these next couple of questions are revolving around the current market. So can you please give an overview of the current market scenario? How can you make profitable trades in the current market? Mm, look, that's a good question. Um, the current the current market, and I think it's sheep and cattle. The sheep's probably more stable than cattle. Up what? Certainly, the last couple of months, the the current uh, the current market has been trying to find itself, and because you've had a combination of 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 the processing end of the trade really struggling to sort itself out. I mean, you've got 
you've got the likes of all of you know the top cuts going to restaurants that aren't open anymore uh, you've got panic buying in the supermarkets and at the same time we've got producers that um, in you know probably not in western areas yet but certainly some some areas in eastern Australia have had more grass than they've had for years and so uh, it's it's uh, they've got green grass fever when I think there's a couple of things in the current market scenarios if we go back a couple of months just to give you an example is we talked to our mastermind group in March when the COVID-19 thing first came up and you know because pe people are saying what's the market going to do and and I had one standard answer it's either gonna double or half and I don't know which because we don't know what the market's going to do however what can we do well let's have a look at our inventories of grass money and livestock I need to have time I need to have time in my grass inventory so that I can you know if something did happen in the market I can work my way through the other side of it I don't have to sell animals into it the same with my animals I need to have time in my animals I don't want we said at the time we don't want animals coming coming out of, in, in a couple of months time having to go into a feedlot when the market gets depressed for whatever reason now that didn't really happen so how do we make profitable trades that's um, that scenario I so showed you working out what the sell is, knowing our cost of carry and knowing our buy price, we can work out is it a profitable trade or not. And, and so um, knowing our cost of carry is, is the fundamental thing. We've got quite a few people been sitting aside, holding cash, waiting to buy into the market. They haven't been able to see opportunities. And we've got a lot that are buying because again, as I said, some people have higher and lower costs of carry than others. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. I think that you may have touched on this next one, which is about how do you take the nervousness out of buying back into a rising market that has that level of uncertainty surrounding it? Mm, that's a great question. And actually, even, even some of our most seasoned producers, are we're having this conversation with them at the moment. And um, you know, a rising market, I often use sheep as the example because mostly it's cattle producers that are having that conversation. And if we think about the sheep market, I remember I remember a mastermind member telling me probably, I don't know how long ago, maybe 2013, but sheep, lambs had hit $70 and he said, I'm never paying more than $70 for a lamb. I'm just going to sit out. Well, he'd have been sitting out all this time. And so... I get excited about a rising market. I'm not worried about a rising market at all. Think about it, you know, if 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 I if a market's rising and I pay five dollars for my steers, but the market moves to ten, well, I'm getting ten dollars for every kilo I put on them. That's the key. You see, if we buy into a market and we don't have the grass to move those animals up a grade, like I showed in those calculators, then we could get burnt very badly. We need, it does come back to knowing how much grass we've got. And if we can't complete a trade, like me here at Bathurst at the moment, you know, you might, you'd kind of think, well, we would have had enough rain. We actually don't have enough rain for me to buy cattle to move up a grade. So we've been destocked on the block I look after since July last year. And until I've got feed there, I won't buy animals. Now, uh, if I have the feed, I won't. I'm not too concerned about um, the price as long as there's a margin there using that cost of carry. Thank you. All does come down to the feed on the ground, doesn't it? We it, will it now does, move really into does. some rebuilding questions. Yep. Sorry. Um, so, when the season breaks, what enterprise do you see providing the best short term cash flow? and which would be the most profitable? Hmm. Well, look, it's a good question, which I um, I guess I really relate to. I mean, you know, if, if, if you look at my background and history, I've always been a sheep producer. And so um, there's no doubt about it, sheep are going to produce the quickest turnaround and the, and the quickest cash flow. Having said that, probably goats, would it be even better? 
So, um, uh, but interestingly, you wouldn't not believe this. There are some people that run cattle that will not run a sheep no matter how much money you gave them. So you have to want to do that. But I've seen quite a few, you know, there's a producer here at Bathurst, for example, who's put an exclusion fence up. And until he put that exclusion fence up, he couldn't run sheep for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, dogs were a problem and not dingoes, but um, wild dogs from that have got out of town, big dogs and stuff. So they were a problem. And the other one was his fences weren't necessarily secure enough to keep sheep in. Uh, but he he destocked in um it's an interesting aside but he destocked uh over what two and a half years ago now uh and and he he maintains he wouldn't have been able to run cattle he'd run cattle for 20 years he wouldn't have been able to run cattle on the feed he's got because we've had these little short sharp breaks i've been destocked every winter for the last three years however he's been able to run enough sheep at times for shorter times and, and it's been very, very profitable. I mean, uh, he put up an exclusion fence that cost him $200,000 and in 15 months profit over and above all costs of for it to run his farm was 180,000. So um, so I think probably goats and sheep is, is, is gonna be the most profitable, just because of time. That's very interesting, Graham, and thank you very much for that, that answer. And so how would you justify investing now, given the high prices for stock? Mm, well, that last question relates back, but it's what caused me to go and do those spreadsheets there, because I think um, it, it can be a myth if we don't know what it's gonna cost us to feed our animals, to head off into a drought and just feed no matter what, um, we can get caught. And so, you know, there's certainly plenty of people will tell me that, you know, they can, they've they justified what they've uh, fed them with. But I've also, uh, you know, as a producer told me that, um, or as an agent told me, one of his producers spent $4,000 feeding his cows. Well, we haven't seen cows make 4000 yet. And um, that if you do your sums, that could take a very long time to get back. Uh, we don't know how long the drought's going to go, and you guys out west are, you know, I know I went through the 2000 drought, you know, they go on. Those people that, uh, like Jim Lindsay up in, in uh, Queensland, you know, eight years of drought, imagine, he hasn't got enough feed on 60,000 acres to run 300 cattle. Imagine if he just started feeding into that. So I think unless you do your sums, then, you know, you can't justify you it, you can't justify it and i think those spreadsheets i showed you can justify it i'll pay more money when i've got when i can actually put weight on animals or move them up a grade as against um you know knocking my country about knocking my bank account about knocking my livestock about and probably more importantly knocking myself about emotionally that's come through about those spreadsheet brains. So we might answer that now. Um, it was, how do you determine the value of the weaners in the breeding scenario? Yeah, good question. So in a breeding scenario, um, uh, it, look, this is how I, I, there's two ways to determine, no, there's three ways, probably more, more than that. The simplest ways um, is to ring your agent. He'll know, he's in the market every week. He knows what those wieners are worth. Uh, the, um, the other one is to look at the market reports. I mean, at KLR, we produce something called the 32nd market report. We, we report 80, 80 odd um, sheep and cattle reports across the markets across Australia every day. And um, well, on, update them on a daily basis. And and the other way is Auctions Plus. Auctions Plus right now is where a lot of people are selling. So that'll tell you the value of your wiener and then um, being able to work out what it's gonna cost you, not just for the direct costs, which is a mistake we make, we, we forget about, we've got to find a way to pay those overheads along the way. And, and so um, it's using that and what we're finding is some people 
well, some of our clients right now are actually selling uh, their cattle as weaners right now because they're overpriced for them to take through to the feedlot. Very, very interesting consideration, isn't it? That opportunity cost of not selling now versus selling later. Um, so on that is a 450 kilogram steer at $3.90 over or undervalued compared to a cow calf unit at $2,000. Yeah, look, that's that's a that's a really good question, and uh, it it um, it's often a question that that our graduates have is you know how do I compare say a steer to a cow calf or or you know even more extreme how do I compare 450 kilo steer to a um, to a, uh, a pregnant ewe. Um, we really can't do that. So they're two separate sums. And if I had a whiteboard here, I, I'd pretty much draw it up, but I'd say, okay, is this steer overpriced or un, uh, over, over, undervalued or over, sorry, I've got to go with my terminology, overpriced or underpriced. And um, there's a couple of things just simply looking at that I go, I'd probably go, you know, that's a feedlot entry weight. If I keep that steer, there's two things going to happen with that steer is it's going to eat a lot of grass and I'll need to make sure I've got plenty of grass to keep that steer on, on the go. The, the other one is it's also at a big risk in terms of price because I haven't got a lot of time in that steer. You know, he's he's going to have to head out at some point I, unless I grow him out to be a bullock and you'd want pretty low cost to be able to do that profitably. So. So let's say I go, oh, all right, oh, well, that steer, he's overpriced just based on my grass. I might as well sell him. So I sell that steer and I say I sold enough steers and I put $100,000 in the bank. Then what I do, this is what we call a change in class. Then what I do is I do a separate set of sums on the cow-calf unit. So I'm looking at buying a cow-calf and I look at if I move that cow calf up a grade, what would it be? It's going to be a cow and a weaner, a split trade. And so, um, you know, I might be going to sell the cow out, sell the calf out in a simple sum. And so I'm going to compare what's going to cost me to move that cow calf through to a cow calf splitter. And if that's profitable at $2,000, then uh, that could be a good deal. But again, you know, I always widen the conversation out and say, okay, you know, how much time is that going to take? How much grass have you got to do that? And it could be, you know, a good example of, of, of a similar trade is on Friday night, we had a client, a client ring me and he said, he said, how's this sound? I just sold pregnant cows for $2,350 and I replaced them with pregnant heifers for $1,400. So in effect, yeah, he's got two different things, but in effect, he took nearly $1,000 off the table, yet he's still got an animal that can have a calf. So um, that's, that's how you look at it. You can't compare the two together. You, you, you compare within their class and, and, um, and then to change class, you've got to put your money across. It's an amount of money, not a direct trade. Thanks. No worries, thank you, Graham. Um, so then, what factors should producers be looking at to assess profitability or indicators to buy and sell, or whether they should just look at adjustment? Uh, look, that's a good question. And look, if anybody's got questions, they can type them in there, can't they? Extra questions. Um, what what factors should producers be looking at to assess profitability of a possible livestock purchase? If you look in the markets for indicators to buy or sell, how can I tell if it's best to buy or a gist? You know, look, that's a question that uh, is is pretty common. And, and you know, the drought has been as long as it has been. It's it, Even though people have made some really good decisions along the way, you know, some of us don't start to run short of capital. And so, um, there can be various reasons why people will do things. One would be they might take on all adjustment because they don't have the capital going into the livestock market. Um, some of our some of our people have done a bit of both. You know, they wanted some cash flow to 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 keep things ticking over whilst they also entered the market steadily and averaged their way in. Um, 
I, I think the indicator for me, the definite big indicators I've talked about a few times is, do I have the grass to move these up, up a grade? So I, for me to buy animals now, I'll give you an example, it's probably the simplest way. So if I go back to last year, um, in February, I did a sell buy, so I sold some steers and I replaced with some steers in February. Uh, we, we'd had quite a bit of rain here, Bathurst. We went through to April, we hit the first week of April and, and it, it was really growing and normally here you'll get a lot of, um, you'll get a lot of fogs, about 95 mils a year is equal in fogs in, in Bathurst. So, so we made uh, the judgment that that feed's gonna grow based on the moisture we had, the feed we had. So we went and bought more cattle. But interestingly, what I was thinking about along the way was, okay, if it turns dry on me, how do, where, where's my get out point? And so when I bought those cattle in February, I bought 260 kilos knowing that if I got to July and ran out of feed, I'd, they'd probably be around 330, which is the weight that I knew feedlots would be taking them. Um, the April cattle I bought, they were 280 because I wanted to match them with the others and I also wanted them at 330. Now, the interesting thing is that those fogs didn't happen. It's very much like this year. They didn't happen. We had hot sunny days right through to June. And by July, we had to destock. And they, we sold, even though I intended to take them to 420 or more, uh, we sold them out at 330. So um, it comes down again, it just always comes down to the grass every time. Thanks, Graham. We do have a question that's come through on here. Again, can you give us an idea of what the cost of carry is? Examples maybe for different regions or some of your graduates? Yep. Yep. So um, I probably should have put it on a slide, but fundamentally, uh, cost of carry is made up of two parts. We've got our direct costs. So our uh, direct costs are things like uh, freight in if we were buying stock. It's the processing costs, so drench, dips, vaccines, tags, all of those things. Um, and then we have our selling costs. Well, sorry, if we're running sheep, it'd, we'd have shearing as well, our shearing costs. Um, we'd have the, sh the, the selling costs of both the wool and the sheep or just the cattle, so you've got commission, um, you might have yard, dues and levies, those sorts of things. So they're all our direct costs. Direct costs are, um, change per animal. So if it, you know, if I've got one animal and my direct costs are um, $50, then if I have two animals, my direct costs are going to be $100. My overheads are things like electricity, uh, repairs and maintenance, fuel, um, uh, accountancy, my drawings, all the things that I that I have to spend, which could be say, you know, I'll re use a round figure. Let's say it was a hundred thousand dollars a year. Then that's got to be spread across the number of animals. So if I have a hundred thousand uh, dollars, divide that uh, by the average number of livestock I run for the year, and you know, I can go. You, it's a bit of a rabbit hole to go deep into that, but it's the average number of livestock I run for the year divided by 52, and now I've got a weekly rate of, you know, it could be anything. We have producers that are doing it at $2, we have producers at $10, so it, it varies. But fundamentally, it's all, all the overheads and express them as an adjustment rate. Mm -hmm. That helps. I think that is a very good answer to that question. Um, we do have another question that's just come through here on the question box, so we might answer it as well. Yep. Um, many skeptics say that for us in Western, if we have feed, so does everyone else. Do you have any comment regarding the ability to source adjustment stock and the return given that there is a reasonable supply of adjustment paddocks? Yep, so um, look, that's that's a good question, and I don't know that we necessarily should make assumptions. I mean, if we, in my experience, 
it doesn't rain everywhere. And I think I probably spent the last three or four years talking on, I do a discussion call every week. And often what I said every week was, you know, cause people go, when it rains, the market's going to go through the roof. And I, I would ask why, and they go, well, you know, everyone's going to want to have stock. But the reality is it doesn't rain everywhere. I mean, this year's a good example right now. I mean, I can pretty much give you a pretty good rainfall feed report. If you if you look at Queensland early in the year, eastern Queensland from say Gundawindi right through to right through to Townsville was pretty good. But it's got very dry very quickly. I was talking to someone at Toowoomba today and they haven't they've stopped even sowing crops up in there. Very dry. You look at uh you you look at places like Bathurst here, for instance, very dry. But then you go Molong, Dubbo, back up through Bawarana to Burke, pretty damn good. Um, but it, whereas last year everywhere was dry, but Western Victoria wasn't. Um, so in my experience at Ivanhoe, there were plenty of times when we experienced those big seasons and we could put adjustment on. And maybe people, you know, especially in the winter time, you know, you really can't um, you can't get production out of animals in this country here in the winter time, but out there, if you've got winter feed, you can. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people that are our, you know our clients, and one of the things is is understanding that having a conversation, if you want to take on adjustment and and you, or you want to put adjustment on, you've got to have a conversation around what the value is for both parties. And and I've seen plenty of people tell me, I can't get adjustment. And you ask them and they get what they want. And they go, oh, I want $12. And I go, well, that's not the market anymore. And they go, well, it was in the drought and I had to pay it. Well, it doesn't matter what it was. It's what the market is today. And I remember in 2000, you know, we went into 2000 and, and uh, we were putting cattle on at $1.50 a week. But I had 2,000 cattle come on, so it was still a pretty good deal. And and but we had, we'd had 13 inches from December to April, and so it it varies along the way. I mean, you guys out in the west have had a long dry period, drier than longer and drier than you deserve. But um, I look, I've got people looking for adjustment now. There's plenty of people looking for adjustment. There's plenty of people wanting to take it on but they're not necessarily matching on price. And I think we might have time for just a couple more questions. It is getting close to the hour mark. Um, so another question, that two questions that we've got here about general livestock marketing. What are some ways of increasing returns with sheep? And is there an ideal percentage of breeding stock and trade stock in your total herd? Yeah, two really good questions. The first one, I'll, I'll approach it from from an experience I had. Oh gosh, you know, probably 1996 or seven or something. I was invited to uh, come to a Department of Ag group in Dubbo. There were was was a Western Division group, and there were um, various people from the different departments there, plus um, a couple of us that were producers. And it was really interesting in that in that forum we workshopped it like for three days and our our task was how do we improve 21 plus my profitability from 21 plus micron wool and and um it was really interesting because the agronomist wanted to deal with trefoil and burr and 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 the plant issues the vet wanted to deal with well it's all about worms and parasites and when they came to me i said well to me it's around lambing percentages and they said, that's got nothing to do with wool. And I said, well, it's got everything to do with wool. Because if we can improve our lambing percentages, then, you know, we've got more to sell. We've got more, we've got uh, more ability to select, select on our genetics. We can improve our wool. There's a whole lot of things. So I think that's certainly something in a sheep breeding enterprise is, is and I'm sure that most people are well aware of that, is, is how can we improve our lambing percentages uh, that in a breeding enterprise is going to make all all the difference, and and obviously making sure we can do it profitably. The second question: Is there an ideal percentage of breeding stock and trading stock? 
look, we have a generic thing we say at a school, you know, you probably shouldn't run more than about 65 or 70% of your average carrying capacity as a breeding herd. Now, it's not a rule, we say it because um, we, we don't want people having to keep making emotional decisions to dig into their breeding stock. And so that's what can be, be challenging. I think one of the best uh, examples I've seen of someone doing it really well is somebody who's been uh, in, in drought in Queensland for eight years. And uh, that family had a policy of um, basically 50% breeding, 50% trading. Now, most people, when they hit a drought, will sell all their trading stock and then and then start to, to try and protect their breeding stock and then dig into their breeding stock. Well, they decided at the start of the drought, they'd bring them both down to the same to the same levels. And actually, they're sitting at about 15% breeding of what they'd normally would have had eight years ago and 15% trading. But he said that the positive factor for him has been that through those eight years, he's been able to keep that trading enterprise producing cash flow for the business. And, and um, so again, you know, it's, it's really working around those principles and it's an emotional decision to have to sell our breeding stock. It's very hard and a difficult thing, but you know, we, we really need to make sure that we, we're making the best decisions we can for our, grass inventory for our money inventory for our livestock inventory and as I said you know our mental health and well-being is the most important thing I think when we're going through these situations. Thank you Graham. Well that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I'll give the audience one last chance if there's any more questions. Um, Graham did you have any closing remarks you wanted to make before we sign off? Uh, Look, I, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, chat with everyone today. I, I'm really looking forward to coming and doing that school at Broken Hill. Um, we, we've never done one in the Western Division, um, and but I know there's quite a few graduates out there that have had uh, you know great success using the principles. Um, you know, people say, "Oh, your system doesn't work here or whatever." It's not a system, it is simple principles and those principles work everywhere. And so I think, um, you know, if, if, if you can come and spend two and a half days with Rod and I, uh, we'll, um, we'll share with you some, some information that I think, you know, will help you like it's helped us. As I said, if you want to, um, if you're interested in let it, being let know, obviously the local land service is gonna keep you informed, but you can also go to the KLR marketing .com.au website and register your interest there. There's also the opportunity to grab a one hour CD that we can mail out to you where all three of us will be talking about these things. So, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me along today. Thank you, thank you very much for giving us your time and your knowledge this afternoon, Graham. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, it would be greatly appreciated if you could all take the time to complete the post-webinar survey. It's a good way for us to guide the direction of future events that we run. And as Graham mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Graham or myself. You will also receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this webinar if you wish to listen again. Thank you all.